<clears throat> we're continuing our study in the epistle of Paul to the church at Ephesus, or to the Ephesians, if you will. Salvation, individual, and corporate. Our subtitle is The Unity That Believers Have in Christ Brings Unity in the Church, which is the body of Christ. It's important that you keep that principle in mind, because what I want you to see is that in the end, Paul was going to be stressing very hard that the unity the church should have outweighs the diverse differences. Jesus Christ does not want a church that is divided, fighting, arguing. He wants a church that is united on the essentials. As Augustine once said, we are united in our essentials, but we allow for diversity in areas that we believe are non-essentials. What are those essentials? Well, I think some of that Paul is bringing out very clearly now. Clearly, the gospel is essential. Clearly, the understanding of man's depravity is essential. Clearly, the concept of redemption as being covenantal and the fact that Christ is the only way of redemption is essential. The resurrection of Jesus Christ has to be essential, as well as our spiritual resurrection in Christ, as well as the physical resurrection we shall have in Christ. Clearly, so far, these are the essential things. And it all begins with the understanding that these things are all predetermined by the triune God who before the foundation of the world determined how and who would be redeemed, who would be rejected, and then the means of that redemption being in the roles that each would take from the beginning, which I think those roles were predetermined before the plan itself was set forth. Therefore, we have much doctrine already covered as essentials. Things that cannot be denied. Things that are going to be so essential in the unity of the body of Christ that you can't deny these things without having problems throughout the rest of your theology, let alone coming to a orthopraxy, a right practice of the church. There's going to be diversity. But is that diversity in the essentials? For once the essentials are known and established, any diversity that causes schism is just that and nothing more. Very important. It's one of the things our denomination has taken up and has tried to do, to determine how and why and what are essentials and how and why we, in the diversity of things not essential to the history and practice of the church, can be given liberty without destroying our unity. And so I think it's important for us to keep these things in mind. And we've gone very slow, and I've gone slow for a reason. I really want to establish the principle this redemption clearly is an act of sovereign God. Because that's where we begin to understand our unity. It's not a unity that we make of our own choice because of our own abilities to be a part of the redemption, that somehow we have a, a say in those things. It is a unity that we must accept that God has given wherein denying these things would be destructive to the church of Jesus Christ itself. And so I want us to remember everything that we are establishing here has an implication in chapters 4, 5, and 6, which are all 
practical applications of essential doctrine to the church. Well, let's look, if you will, Ephesians 2. We're looking at this section. Actually, the whole section is 1 through 10, but we're just looking at 4 through 10 currently, and we're going to particularly look at verse 7 today. Paul writing says, beginning at verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. <clears throat> and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Shall we pray? Our holy God, we thank you for the privilege to come again to examine your holy word. We pray, O oh God, that you would help us to discern the truth, the meaning the purpose that you have set forth in this great work of redemption, having raised us up with Christ, that we would understand how we are to be that testimony and witness to you and of your grace. A testimony and a witness that cannot deny the essentials, but must have unity among them where you have stressed essential and unity. We ask, O oh God, that we would understand what you require of us daily in our life and that we would be faithful to the duties you have given to us. We ask now, God, as we come to your word, would you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive what the word and spirit would teach us. For we ask this in Christ's most precious and holy name, Amen. This Lord's Day, as we turn our attention here to verse 7, here we see the Apostle speaking of our purpose in being raised together in Christ, making us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ. Again, we know that this is a work that has not been a work of man. It is a work of God it is a work that enters into the heart of man who is dead in sin and has been made alive through Christ Jesus our Lord by the application of his atonement upon the cross. If you will, let's look at verse 7. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Here, this verse itself gives the very purpose of God's saving activity to us. Why has God done all this work of salvation? Why from eternity has He chosen us to be holy before Him in love? Why has He made us accepted in the Beloved? Why, when dead in trespasses and sin, hath he quickened us, raised us up, made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ? The answer to this question, or these questions that we have put forth, are really given to us in this verse. Let's look at the 
verse itself, and we'll just kind of break it down a little bit, not too much, because I don't want to lose the whole effect of the verse as it is given here. In verse 7, you have the purpose, the purpose clause which directs all this work toward a function of God's work future. The English word translated here, that, in the King James text is the Greek word hina. And it is a subordinating conjunction, which Pastor Rick said I shouldn't say that, but I'm saying it anyway. Which is connecting, if you will, linking words and ideas together. Thus, you can also translate it, so that. In other words, this is the purpose. That's what he wants you to do. He's connecting this whole idea that we've read so far, verses 1 through 6. Dead in sin, now alive in Christ. There's a purpose for this. There's a very purpose, not only that God from eternity has done that, but in the way he has brought it to pass in your life at this appointed time. These are not the first Christians. But he's saying this is true of the whole body of Christ. We all are brought from death to life. And this is the very purpose of God. Here's how he's connecting it. Just look back at verse 4 through 6. But God, who was rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together. You see, the unity we have in the body of Christ, this is that aspect of corporate election, not like the Roman Catholic Church. We've all been individually elected by God unto Christ, but when Christ goes to the cross, he dies for the whole corporate body of the elect at one time. And the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. <coughs> Again, we have this connection. Look at the wording. <coughs> In Christ Jesus. Together with Christ. In Christ Jesus. The emphasis. We've seen it in chapter 1. You're seeing it here again. Chapter 2. What has happened to us is. Literally. To be a witness. In the which the world. Would see the work of God. Our salvation is a picture of God's grace towards man. We have not saved ourselves, but God is the one who is doing the saving. Then he gives you this Greek verb where he says he might show the Greek verb means to indicate, that is to show, to manifest, or to give evidence of. This is the cause of God. He is manifesting or showing his great work in us. It goes back to the principle, if you'll remember, we said we are his inheritance. We are the trophies of his redemption. Paul's reemphasizing that. It's just not that we're elect to be the ones who receive the redemption, and therefore, in that way, we've got a special calling and marking out, but it is also in what we have been called to do as those who have been raised spiritually from death to life. You can have the one, and you could argue it, but it would not include anything necessary at that point in time except for saying this is the eternal purpose of God, that we should be his inheritance. Wonderful. Paul's now saying, oh, but let me explain to you something. That's God's eternal purpose and how he's going to work all these things together. 
But now he has actually done that work through his spirit to you in time and space. And you know what? It's not that you're just called, but you are literally being called to continue in this work of God's grace as a witness and a testimony to Christ and to the salvation that God has sovereignly brought to you. He's really getting ready to lay out the rest of these verses here, up through verse 10. When he talks about being created in Christ Jesus for good works. One aspect of this verb in its future understanding is we are and we will always be that testimony. Because it is the Spirit of God that is at work in us. That was God's purpose. It wasn't just to passively elect us so that you end up with some kind of Gnostic idea of redemption. Oh, we have the knowledge of the truth. No, no. Paul's saying there's much more than this knowledge. If you have the true knowledge, and if you truly have been raised from death to life, do you not know God's intended purpose was to make you a witness to him? Because the verb is an aorist subjunctive, it denotes the complete and full showing forth of God's glorious work in those he hath elected. The verb clearly means that God intends to make such a grand display of his wondrous grace before all that all may see, they may admire, and they may glorify him in that work of redemption. The same verb is used to show some sort of the same type of expression of an action that actually takes place. For example, Romans 9.22. What if God wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? There's an actual action taking place. Hebrews 6, 10 through 11. For God is not unjust to forgive your works, excuse me, to forget your works and labor of love, which you have shown. It's an action. You've shown it toward his name. Not that you were just elect in his name. You were shown this in his name. You have shown it. You've manifested in your life. My friends, if I could say this to you historically, this is known as the practical outworkings of Calvinism. Calvinism is not an abstract theology. Oh, if you know the five points of Calvinism, you've got to be a Christian. i got news to you. You don't. you just got to get somebody to repeat it enough and hear the arguments enough that they can say it, and maybe even properly. Not normally, though. It's hard enough to try to teach them anything else, let alone to get the theology exactly precise. But, you know, if you work on it long enough, you can get them to repeat it. That is not making them believers. It's not the abstract of the knowledge. It's the knowledge with a practical application. And never from the beginning was there ever any intent but to have a practical element with Calvinism. You take away the practical side... Calvinism in of itself means nothing to us. You have to have the truth. But the truth becomes a reality in time and space. In you. That's the point. The verb indicates to whom God has demonstrated this greatness of his grace. Those whom he hath brought from death to life. The verb is showing that it is the very action of God for his intended purpose. His own glory. A glory that is evidenced in bringing dead men to life. God's purpose, therefore, in saving his people reaches beyond man and his interest. And rather demonstrates the interest of a sovereign God. 
Oh, yeah, it's God's interest that's involved here, not ours. It's God's interest. When we say it's the purpose of God, we mean it's the purpose of God not to do something for our interest, but for his own and to bring it to pass as he wants it exactly brought to pass because it is totally for his glory, for his honor, for his interest. God's own glory, that is his chief aim here in this verse. It is for this very reason that God displays his grace in all of its beauty and its transforming power. That's the heart of it, of what's going on, isn't it? <laughs> One of the very first questions when we meet people here who come and visit and they want to take the Lord's Supper, Pastor Rick and I say, Tell us about your redemption. How did you, what did you got saved? What was it like? Yeah, you know, praise God for those who can tell you how they were transformed. But so often we get just a, a blank look. But you see, God's redemption is transforming. That's the point. That's what Paul's making an emphasis. Hey, this isn't just... Get your theology straight, and if you get your theology straight, you're in. No, that's a Gnostic-type concept. It's more than just a set of doctrines. Oh, we can only know redemption through the propositions of Scripture. No one denies that. But those who have been renewed by the Spirit of God have been transformed in their thinking and they move from death to life. They reject the way of the world, and they take up the way of Christ. And that's what he's saying here. He has redeemed us that he might show us to the world as a testimony. It's the very thing we look for even as Christians. It's the very thing Paul says here in the first verse. I am so thrilled about your faith and that you have love for the brethren. What is he saying? You're living out your faith. And it speaks well of you. It speaks well of you having been transformed by the power of God. Oh, some might object, and you're going to especially hear that from Arminians, to the idea that God is saving a people for himself. There is a particular people which would, at best in our humanistic mindset, cause us to believe that God is simply selfish when you present this as his work of redemption. To some, this may seem somewhat cold in some other selfish way. And then you have those Weird statements from people. Well, if that's the way God is, I, I will not serve that kind of God. That's okay. You can either serve him or not serve him. And if you don't serve him, I got news for you. Your end is not going to be real happy. Your feet will be searing before you ever hit the lake of fire. When people say that, the first thing I think of is, even if I was a Christian and didn't believe it, I would never make such a foolish, stupid statement. You could say, I'm not sure I believe that. I'll think about it. You can say, I've never been taught that. I don't know that I can believe that for sure. But to say if that is your God, if that's what you think God is, I will not serve him, I think that's about as foolish as you can be. The text here gives a different expressed meaning. And the expression is that God is overshadowing through his majesty of sovereignty 
And he has condescended even in sending his own son for the very purpose of redeeming a people to be his own. And thus the writer himself says, in his kindness toward us. This is not an abstract God who just sits back and does all these things. In the, he hath taken upon himself through the second person the form of man. He's actively worked to bring redemption about. He's taken himself our form. He is like unto manner like us, Hebrews says, in all manner like unto us. He's gone through all the temptations and yet he has overcome them all for our redemption. He's not even an abstract. That's Paul's trying to get that across. You know, it's not like God didn't do something here besides elect. That's why I say to you over and over again, never let someone say, oh, election is salvation. It is not. It is the process by which God chose individuals in his son. Who is salvation. And thus you have all these expressions together with Christ. In Christ. He wants us to remember it's not just an abstract idea. God really took upon himself the form through his son of man and gave himself for us. In real time and space. He didn't just elect us before the foundation of the world in him. In time appointed, he came. He took upon himself the form of man. He went to the cross. And he died for us. Oh, the God side doesn't die, of course. But the man was sinless. He's that sinless lamb that needs to pay the price as a substitute for others. Thus, he speaks of his kindness toward us. We deserve his condemnation. It's one thing if God would not condemn us. But it's the way he expressed the love in Christ. In Christ. With Christ. Jesus our Lord. This is not selfishness, by no means. It's God's kindness. It's God's unmerited favor. That's how we define the grace. Grace that extended in mercy and in the kindness of Jesus Christ transforms us into the likeness of his Son. Next, the apostle states that God has done this to show in the ages that are coming, literally, if you will, or in the coming ages, you could also translate it. Or it can also be translated for all time to come. That great salvation that has been given by God. By the apostle using the word eons from the Greek. It is a way of speaking generally about all future time, from the cross to the eternal redemption of his people. And the eons that are coming means in those eons that follow, the eon of this world, this time. Thus, the plural denotes their endlessness. Time shall be no more when all God's saving work shall have reached its glorious goal when the timeless eons of eternity have finally come upon us. After the consummation of history, we continue to be the trophies of his redemption. Because of the limitation of our finite minds, the scripture sometimes uses terms that denote time when they speak of eternity. Eons which in reality is a way of saying timelessness. The Greek preposition in here is translated in, meaning that God has done this now, so that in the future he might show his abundance 
of grace to those who are his chosen as an example of that mercy and kindness that has been extended to us. It seems, however, that we could also not forget that this is for all ages to come. Because we are that testimony of God's grace. It has to include our redemption in Christ, our transformation from the time that we are transformed to the very end. Now, that's the doctrine of the eternal call of God. When we talk about irresistible grace and that doctrine of Calvinism, you notice how we're back to Calvinism again. The eternal calling of God, that irresistible calling of God, it's not a work of the Spirit. It's a call of God the Father. He appoints a time which the Spirit transforms us. But that is not the end of the calling. The calling is continual until the eternal, full redemption of soul and body has been completed. And then we are the called in Him. But we are in that process of calling. Thus, one aspect of the practical side of Calvinism is there is always that calling. The calling to Christ, the calling to be like Christ, the calling to live like Christ, the calling to put on the very example of the transformation of the work of the Spirit in your life so that we seek as Christians to do what will honor God in everything that we try to do according to His word. I think the apostle then is therefore stating that what God has done now in Christ, being raised, and our being raised in Him, we will for all time be a true demonstration of grace. But that demonstration is not in passivity, but in activity. The meaning may also be expressed for days that never end, if you want, in this text. For years that never have been yet thought of as it would be for man. We are and always will be to the glory of God, whether in a conventional time and space or in eternity. We are always in His grace. There are some who have held that in the ages spoken of here, that this is some kind of a concept that precedes Christ's parousia. They maintain that it is not the future being spoken of, but it is about the current passage of time which the earth has not run its course. But this is rejected because the previous text of chap in this chapter, Paul speaks of the chapter one, Paul speaks of the fullness of time, which is not the emphasis of the Greek text here in verse seven. Here he is speaking of ages to come, the eons, not the one time, but of the ages to come. Some hold that it is speaking about the ages that will follow Christ's parousia. This is often taken to mean during the millennium or millennial reign of Christ. This could possibly be true if the text had again used the term eon rather than eons in the plural. We, however, hold that this text certainly has in its context the understanding of our current condition. Of course. If we have been transformed by the Spirit, something has happened to us. There is an active change. One of the questions that we ask people when they come to us, even in membership, how have you changed since Christ came in you through the power of His Spirit? Tell us how your life changed. You once were what and you've now become what? My favorite answer to that question, by the way, was from a minister's wife. And it was not Pastor Rick's wife, by the way. <laughs> Just to make sure you're not walking away from here going, did Sherry say that? No. Hers was, I married him. Wrong answer. Wrong answer. If she'd have said, I am married to Christ... And I had to quit doing the things of the world and start doing the things of Christ as the scriptures set them forth. That would have been the right answer. 
The answer is not marrying your spouse. It's being married to Christ. changes here, but it's also all pointing to the future. There is in the resurrection that we have in Christ's resurrection, a resurrection waiting for us to be like Him. We are to be eternally His in the way that Christ is His. That's why John says, when he comes, we will be like him. We don't know what he is like, but we know that when he comes, we shall be like him. That's the emphasis. You've got to get this. God forgives sins of the most sinful kind. And that's the gospel itself, is it not? God's in the business of forgiving us of sins. But that gospel includes within it not just election, justification, pardon, but it includes the concept of adoption and sanctification and glorification. And that's what you're seeing that Paul is expressing here in this text. That state of glorification. Now note, he goes on to say, the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ. Here, look at what the Apostle Paul says. He uses this superlative for the participle here to go beyond, meaning the exceeding riches. He says that over and over again. It's one of the favorite things the Apostle Paul said. For example, Ephesians 1, 19. And what is the exceeding greatness in other words, he almost can't tell you what it is. Words just can't explain to you the greatness of what has taken place through the transforming work of the Spirit in you and in him. You remember what Apostle Paul says when he talks about, I'm a Jew, I'm this, I'm this. He says, man, if anybody could be found without fault, if you want to have a religion of men and be able to say, I'm following it, I did that. But he said, I count it all rubbish for the knowledge of Christ. You can't get here except that a God who has condemned you for your sin has through such exceeding great riches hath brought you here himself by his power. This phrase, by the way, may sometimes be rendered, so great is his kindness that no one can imagine it, or that words, as I said, cannot describe it sufficiently. You ever talk to somebody about salvation who doesn't have a slightest idea what salvation is? Get with somebody who goes to church, but church today, especially a church that's liberal. You try to explain to them what happened when you were transformed by the Spirit of God, when you got saved. You try to explain to them how your life is different. Because in their minds, they're trying to still make a difference by applying all the humanistic things they have heard about. We need to be better humanitarians. We need to do this. We need to hug trees. We need to do... And you hear all these things, and you say, well, you know, biblical Christianity is something that happens within wherein we realize our bankruptcy and it is such an exceeding, great, kind redemption given to us that when our eyes are open, we rejoice and we chase after the Christ of Scripture, wanting to know Him better, to do His will, and they just sit and look at you. And you realize then you can't. There's no way of explaining this. It's not an empirical thing. But it is a real experience of transformation. And the love that God has showed us, the Apostle Paul here gives this concept of his generosity, his kindness toward us. 
You see, he expressed the very same things. For example, Romans 2, 4. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and longsuffering, knowing not that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Or Romans eleven two. 2. Therefore, consider the goodness and the severity of God on those who fell. Severity, but toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also shall be cut off. That this grace is expressed to us, how? In the Lord Jesus Christ. Meaning, that it was through Christ Jesus wherein God's grace is manifested in us. The whole expression may be rendered by the way in which he loved us through Christ Jesus. And literally, if you want to, you can extend it. And by the way that Jesus Christ loved us. The Father loves us. His Son expresses that love to us through his own sacrifice. Well, let me just say in conclusion at verse 7 here. Here we now have the final and definitive reason for God's actions on behalf of the elect. His reason for making us alive, raising us up, seating us along with his son in the heavenly realms. That in the ages to come, literally in all future times since our redemption has taken place, the riches of the divine grace of God would be shown in us until eternity and through eternity. This is the meaning of the verbal expression, he might show. Such was his love to those who were lost, that it would be an everlasting monument of his mercy, of his kindness, of his grace, a perpetual and unchanging proof that he was good, graceful, gracious, excuse me, and merciful to those who are the called. Thus, he says, we are raised up with Christ. We are made to take a part of that glory. That's what that phrase means, being in Christ and being raised up together in Christ. We are being made to be made partakers of honor and glory and other that that others may have that sense of seeing God's divine goodness in us. The exceeding riches of His grace. That is, the abounding or overflowing riches of God's grace is one of Such an expression here by Paul. What can we learn from this verse? First, that one purpose of our conversion and salvation of sinners is to furnish us, as it were, the proof of God's goodness and mercy. The fact that he would save even one would be such an expression of it. But that he is through every generation throughout history chosen a people from among the nations of the earth to be his is a great demonstration of God's mercy and goodness that certainly is undeserved. Secondly, another purpose is that our conversions may be encouragements. People look at us and say, what is it about these Christians that makes a difference? They're not like the world. They're different from the world. That those who profess Christ will look and say, what an encouragement these people are. They persevere to the end, no matter what comes in their life. No matter what hardship, trial, adversity, they continue to that high calling of God in Jesus Christ. The fact that such sinners, for example, as the Ephesians, had been pagans and were pardoned and saved, affords encouragement to us in this day and age. You want to talk about a pagan city. You want to talk about one of the worst kinds of anti-theistic understanding of the God of heaven and of Christ. And seeing the work of Christ manifest there, what an encouragement that they not only left what they were raised in, but came to follow Christ and lived it in their life. Pursued it to the end. 
That's why Paul was so proud of them. I heard a minister one time was told, you know, the revival meeting we had this week, this is back in the old days when they had revival meetings, and even Presbyterians had revival meetings back then, believe it or not. We don't have them anymore, but you know, they were basically Bible studies and different things. But the idea of revival was really an imitation of the Great Awakening in America because the very things that they began to do as the spirit began to fall was to have nightly meetings. Once a week wasn't enough, and then it became twice, and then three, and pretty soon it was all seven. And so they imitated that, thinking maybe, and that's just the pragmatic side of their Christian understanding, maybe if we do this again, we'll get another great outpouring of the Spirit of God. Well, they were wrong in that. But I find it so interesting that one man was told, you know, at our meeting this week, 35 people were saved. You must be proud of that. And he said, I will be proud of that when I come back in five years and see that they're still here. One of my favorite stories from George Whitfield's life is he was walking down the street one day with another minister. A man stumbled across the street. He says to him, Reverend Whitfield, do you know me? He says, no, he says, but I can see you're inebriated. He says, well, I'm one of your converts. He says, clearly you're one of mine and not one of God's. The real gospel changes people. It changes their lives. The history of the church, the reason that we read biographies of men, and understand something, in reading biographies of men, you don't hear all of the problems they have. They have real problems. They suffer. They don't overcome everything. They're human. They strive to do what is right. And sometimes it seems like Satan just pounds them into the ground as hard as he can, hoping that they give up and will just throw in the towel and quit. But the reason why we read the lives of saints is because the real testimony of the end is they overcame, no matter what adversity came to their life. But something Pastor Rick was sharing with us as he preached yesterday at our Presbytery meeting. We must overcome, persevere to the end. That's what's happening here. That's what Paul's saying about Christians. They persevere. They've been transformed. They're going to be conformed. This is the work of God. It's not their work. Even their transforming, though it takes into perspective their conscience life, it is nevertheless the outworking of the purpose of God they cannot thwart that and call themselves Christians. The conversion of great sinners is also a very special proof of the divine being laid hold of by the grace of God. But it's not a time to stand up and tell all these war stories of the past. It's just how great of a sinner I am now I am no longer that person. And thus, when we see people converted, it is not encouragement to us. When we see someone leave the path of destruction and come to the path of righteousness. Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.16, However, for this reason I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all longsuffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Paul says, I hope my life will be a testimony. Heaven is the home of the redeemed. We must express that heavenliness now in our actions. The question that we ask is, how is Christ being manifested in you today? That is a real question. I didn't ask, do you know the five points of Calvinism? Have you memorized the shorter catechism? 
Have you studied the confession? I didn't ask what degrees you had. The question I ask is, how is Christ being manifested in you? If you cannot hold your life up to the Scripture and see where there is conformity to the commandment of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, in your life, that all you know, while it may be true and it may be good, clearly at this point is not helping. The disjunction is the idea that if you have the knowledge, you must possess the Christ. The answer is, by Paul, you not only need to know the knowledge, but you must live it in order to truly possess the Christ. But Paul says that's exactly what God is saving you for. And that's what he's going to conform you to in your life. You will have pitfalls. You will have times of adversity and trials that you may not be able to completely overcome and you'll strive and work. But in the end, through perseverance, guess what? You're always progressing in your salvation, in your sanctification. But it's an up and down battle. It never ends. But we're progressing upwards always. We're growing in the midst of all the battles. But the problem is the guy who is static, straight line. Oh, I'm persevering. No battle. No problems. Nothing. Clearly Satan goes, I don't have to deal with him because he don't have anything to begin with. But those who will progress in the knowledge of the truth, they'll fight, they'll war, they'll push onward. They'll beg, they'll cry, they'll scream for God to help them, to see them through. It's not an easy life being a Christian. But those who persevere in Christ, Paul says, because this is the purpose of God, they are the trophies. They are the trophies of his salvation. This is the purpose of God. You were intended to manifest, to demonstrate in your life the goodness and the kindness and the mercy of God and his grace through Christ. Are you doing that? Shall we pray?